you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. And just to give you a little bit of a backstory, this is the story of Adam and Eve. And uh, at this point in, in their story, ch- uh, chapter 3, verse 9, God has already created the entire world, created all the animals. Adam's gone and named everything. Eve was created. They're now together, and they're hanging out in the garden. And Satan, in the form of a serpent, comes up to Eve and deceives her, and she eats the fruit. And then she goes to Adam, and he eats the fruit. And then the Bible says that once they ate, their eyes were open, and they realized they were naked. So then they, they got fig leaves and they tried to cover themselves up. And so now here comes God and he's looking for them because this is something that he would do regularly. And so here comes God in verse 9 and he says, The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Where are you, Adam? So Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And then God said to him, who told you you were naked? Who told you? Remember those words, who told you? You know, we have to understand that even though we're saved, right, we're born again, we've given our lives to Jesus, we've now come into the kingdom, even though we're born again, we have to realize that every single day we need to have our minds renewed. Every single day, God's word teaches us that, that we have to be renewed so that we can see clearly. And when we see clearly, this whole new world opens up to us because our minds are renewed. Sometimes people call it a revelation, a wow factor, like, oh my gosh, I didn't see it like that before. Wow, now I understand. It's that that amazing moment where you see so clearly everything makes sense. And our minds are so full of things that can destroy us. They're so full of thoughts that can destroy us, of things that people have said that can destroy us. They're so full of memories of bad experiences, things that can destroy us. And so the Bible says that we must renew our minds daily so that we make sure we're looking and seeing the right things. And see, before this moment in the scripture with Adam and Eve, They didn't know what it was to be naked. They had no clue. They had no concept of what that word even meant. At this point, they were completely without sin, and all they knew was the love of God. All they knew was his goodness. All they knew is that every day God would come into the garden, it would be Adam and Eve and God. Adam and Eve and God, and they would walk, and they would talk, and they would laugh, and they would spend time together, and they would, they would just look at the garden and all of the beautiful things, and there was never, ever any concern for them being naked. They had no clue what that was. But the moment he sinned, the moment he ate the fruit, everything changed. Their whole world got rocked, <laughs> but not in a good way. Everything changed. The moment Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, their minds were exposed to fear, and they became exposed to evil. They didn't know what that was before. They had no idea what it was to be afraid. They had no idea what it was to be fearful. They had no idea what it was to run and hide. That was a foreign concept to them. All they knew was love and goodness. And then they ate the fruit. And now they ate the fruit and things shifted. See, church, as believers, as children of God, what we see is filtered through our lenses. So our lenses are the way we see things. So the way we see things in this life is either through the lens of fear or through the lens of love. We see through fear or we see through love. The way we respond to people, the way we we look at situations around us, the way we respond to things that are happening to us, we look at them through the lenses of fear or through love. And we can all see the same thing. We can all stand here and watch the same scenario, the same situation. We can all be involved in a same problem and we all see it differently. 
You ever have a, like there's an accident that happened and the police go and they get like witness reports and, and one witness will say this and another will say this and all of their stories are a little bit different because they all saw the accident differently. Even though they were all there, they all witnessed exactly what happened, their account is different. I heard this story once of uh, two salesmen. They were shoe salesmen and they went to Africa. And so they, they both worked for the same company. And their employer sent one of them to the East Coast and one to the West Coast. And they say, hey, go check things out. See what our options are. Let's see if, you know, what we can do in this country. And so the one who went to the East Coast, he went and he saw and he's like, oh my gosh, they have no shoes here. Nobody's wearing shoes. And so he writes back to his boss and he's like, listen, nobody wears shoes here. There's no options for us. This is never going to work. Like, we have, that's it, shut it down. And then we have the guy on the West Coast who goes and he looks around and he sees that people have no shoes. And he writes back to his employer and he's like, oh my gosh, there's so much opportunity here. People don't have shoes. We can sell so much. Send them now. They both saw the same thing. They both were tasked with the same mission. Go and see, come back and tell me. One saw no opportunity, saw fear, I can't sell to these guys, they're never gonna buy. And the other one saw huge opportunity and be like, yes, I can do this, I love what I do and now I'm gonna go sell and we're gonna make tons of money. See, what we can see from this story is that our perception of things directs us. How we see things directs us. How we view things, how we understand things shifts what we do. How we respond, church, matters. If we respond from love, it's going to take us in one direction. But if we respond from fear, it's going to take us in another direction. See, we all see through a lens. We all see things either through fear or through love. And now that we're saved, it's important that we have the right lens. Now that you're in the kingdom, it's important that we see the right way. Now that we are children of God, we need to make sure that our screens are clear. The lenses we wear determines how we interpret God, his word, and his circumstances. See, you can be saved and be in, your, in the church for like years. Years and years. It could have been saved since you were a kid. Or you could have come into king, the kingdom five years ago or ten years ago. You come in, you're involved in church, you know the Bible inside out, ask you a Bible verse, you can quote it, no problem. You know all the words to the songs, you even might be involved in ushering or Sunday school or doing something in the church, you're in. You come to church every Sunday, you're locked in. But even though you're doing all of these things, you could still be seeing wrong. You could still be looking at things through the wrong lens. See, when you look through the wrong lens, things don't work for you. When you look at life, when you look at God through the wrong lens, you're going to see that your faith is not working the way it's supposed to. You're not seeing the things in your life that God promised for you to have. You're going to see that that. Your belief in God is, is unstable. One minute you're like, yes, God, it's me and you. You're going to do this. I believe it. God said it. That's it. I believe it. And then the next moment, God, are you really going to do it? Did you really say? Are you really, are you really there? And so we, we have believers in the kingdom where one day they're happy and the next day they're mad. And, and one day they're, they're, they look good and the next minute they're unhappy. And then some of them you just can't even approach because you don't know where you're going to get, right? They look like their breakfast was like a bowl of lemon and limes. And they come into church and you're like treading lightly because you're like, I'm not sure what I'm going to get. I'm not sure how this person is going to react to me because sometimes it's nice, sometimes it's not nice. And so... We have all these believers who are living from fear and they're living from doubt. You know why that's happening? Because their perception is wrong. Because our perception is wrong, we are not seeing clearly. We are not looking at things the way God intended for us. And because we are not seeing clearly and our perception is wrong, there's a chain reaction of stuff that happens in our life. And it's not, not good stuff. In Numbers 13, we see that there was a promise that was given to Israel 
And God told them very clearly, I am going to give you this land. In Numbers uh, 13, chapter, sorry, verse 1 to 2, the Lord said now to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So here we go. God sends out. God says to them, guys, send out 12. I am giving you this land. It's yours. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to war for it. You don't have to do anything for it. This land is yours. This is my promise to you. Go and get it. Just send 12 guys. Have them go and look at it. Let them go and see what you are about to step into. There's nothing here that says they had to work for it. There's nothing here that said they had to, to fast for 30 days or they had to sing and have an all-night prayer meeting and all those things. There's nothing here that said they had to work for it. God said, I'm giving it to you. Now go and see. So all 12 of them went on their way. All 12 of them heard the same thing. Yes, God gave us this land. We're going to go. And they're all of the same mindset. God said, God said it. He's going to do it. I believe it. God said it. He's going to do it. I believe it. This land is ours. It's our promise. We just have to go and see. So all 12 of them go. They all spy out the land. But then we find in this story that when they came back, things were different. And suddenly, all 12 of them weren't believing anymore. God said it. I believe it. It's going to happen. Now there was a shift. And we see in the story that 10 of them came back with a negative report. Suddenly, 10 of them, who were part of the 12, who believed it on the way out, doubted it on the way back in. Somewhere in their travel, from their camp to the promised land, back to their camp, they lost hope. Somewhere in their travel, their mind shifted, and now they're like, we are too afraid to go and do this thing that God said is ours. And that happens sometimes to us as believers. That happens to us. You know, we come to church, we have this amazing service, an amazing encounter. Something like this just happened, and we leave church, and we're so fired up. We're so empowered. And then we start walking through our week. And we walk our way on to work, or we walk our way back into our family homes, or we walk our way back into the doctor's office, and suddenly, this amazing moment that we had, we were believing God, and we knew he was going to do it. All of a sudden, we're not sure, and things shift, and suddenly we're afraid. Suddenly we're fearful. And so these 10 men in the group, they were influenced by what they saw, and they suddenly became fearful. They got the promise, and they believed. But then they lost the promise, and they became afraid. See, they all went and saw the same things. They saw the same walls. They saw the same big dudes walking around the land of Canaan. They saw the same trees, the same houses, the same, the same pebbles on the road. They saw the same things. But 10 no longer saw themselves as able to receive what God had promised. In fact, it tells us that in that same story, they came back and they're like, we're like grasshoppers in the sight of these men. All of a sudden, they believed they were these puny little things that had no hope except to hop around. <laughs> But then there were two who continued to believe. Joshua and Caleb in this story, they came back and they were full of boldness and they were full of excitement. They're like, let us go at once. Let us take this land. God has promised us. It is ours. Let's go. They saw the same things. Ten were afraid. And, ten were, and two were like, nope, God said it. He loves us. We're going to have it. They were ready to possess the land. They saw the exact same things, but that was nothing to them. The giants were nothing. The walls were nothing. The people were nothing. The houses were nothing. It was nothing to them because God was with them. And they knew they were going to get what God said. You see, when you look at this group of 12, you can see one thing in this story. Nothing was different on the outside. 
They all walked the same path. They all saw the same things. They all heard the same noises. They all had the same experience. Nothing was different on the outside. So what changed? If they saw the same things, why did 10 come back afraid and two were full of power? Why did 10 come back fearful and think they were now grasshoppers and two of them were like, let's go at once, and they were full of faith because they knew God was with them? What happened was we didn't take into account what was on the inside of them. And so, see, friends, it's not what's on the outside because you look good on the outside. You're well put together, you've dressed up, you got your hair done, your fit is good, it's matching. You've drove to church in a really nice car, you cleaned it yesterday, you've left your nice home and came in your nice car and you came to church and everything on the outside looks good. But on the inside, what's happening? It's what's on the inside that's what, that is what, that, sorry, it's what's on the inside that counts, not the outside. It's what's on the inside of you that affects your perception. And so in this story, 10 were filled with fear. 10. Caleb and Joshua knew God loved them, and because God loved them, he would keep their prom his promise. So then in Numbers 14.1, we see the 10 come back, right? They come back to the camp. And all of a sudden, they start telling people, oh my gosh, these guys are so huge. They're so big. We're like grasshoppers in this sight. We're like puny little things. And they're so huge. They've got these big walls, and they've got these big houses. And they started spreading their fear. And we see in, in 14, chapter 14, verse 1, that all of a sudden, the whole camp became afraid. And the Israelites were now crying. They're like, oh no, we're going to die. The giants are going to stomp on us. We're like puny grasshoppers. And they all became afraid. And suddenly, they all lost the promise. Suddenly, they all did not believe. Suddenly, they were all afraid. They all heard the same thing, church. They all heard God's promise. They all heard God's going to give them this land. They had nothing to do except walk in and look at it. God has promised us a lot of things, and we don't have to work for it. But why do we resort to working for it? And it's crazy to me how fear is so contagious because when people are frightened, they discourage other people, and this discouragement brings on the defeat of other people because fear then just starts pulling down. You're afraid? Oh, no, I'm afraid. We can't do it. You're both afraid? Now I'm afraid. We all can't do it. And so fear acts as this thing that just breaks down your confidence and makes you feel like suddenly you're no longer able to do what God said you're supposed to do. Fear caused them to miss out on the blessing that God had for them. Listen, if there's anything that's going to spread in our church, it's got to be love. If there's anything that's going to be spread in this church, it's got to be hope. It has to be. Because the Bible says where there is love, fear cannot thrive. Where there is love, fear cannot exist. Where there is love, there's no despair. Where there is love, there's only hope. Where there is love, there is life. And so... Looking now back at Genesis where we have Adam, he was afraid. All of a sudden, fear overwhelmed Adam's heart. All of a sudden, he couldn't go to this God that he had been walking with and talking with and joking with and playing with. He couldn't go to him. All of a sudden, in one moment, this God who he fellowshiped with and who he was with, all of a sudden, he's afraid of him. He hid from God. Because he was afraid. And it was the fear that he was experiencing that caused him to tremble at the sound of God. To tremble at his voice. In verse 10 he says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Can you imagine? Here's this God who loves us so much. He loves you, church. He loves you so much. He's done everything he can do. He's made every way possible for you already. He loves you so much. And can you imagine if he turns around and he hears, God, I'm afraid of you? 
And this is, this is what's happening with him and Adam and Eve. He loved Adam and Eve so much. He created this whole amazing garden for them to live in. They had everything that they needed. And they went from walking and talking and being together to, I'm hiding from you, I'm afraid. And so, here is this God who, who, who has the ability to heal them right away but we become afraid of him. Here's this God who has the ability to deliver us right away, but we're afraid of him. Here's this God who has the ability to provide for us right away, and we're afraid of him. We're afraid of him. You know, I, I, I never want to hear my kids say that they're afraid of me. <laughs> that, would, that would break my heart, because I, I love our boys. And you know, to think that they would have to hide from me because of something they did, because they were so afraid of what my reaction would be. I, I, just, I wouldn't want that because they are so loved. I love them so much, you know, and, and they don't understand that it doesn't matter what they do, they can always come. And it's the same situation that Adam and Eve were in. They didn't realize how much God loved them, and they didn't realize that it didn't matter what they did, all they had to do was come back to him. One of our, one of the greatest revelations in the Bible is that of sonship. You know, God, God calls us his sons. We are his sons, not his servants, not, not sinners, not slaves. We're not bound. No, we are sons. We are sons. Girls, we are sons. There's, see, there's this, this principle in the Bible about sonship and how the sons receive the inheritance. We all are now eligible to receive the inheritance because we are in the kingdom. We are sons. And from the very beginning, God looked at Adam and Eve as sons, and they were supposed to receive everything that he had for them. We were never, never, ever to see ourselves as anything other than sons of God. See, in this moment, Adam understood God's power because he saw the garden and everything that he created. He understood that, that God was wise. He understood that God was ruling. But in this moment, he didn't understand God's love. And so his reaction was one of fear where he decided he was going to go and hide and he was going to go and cover himself because he didn't understand how much God loved him. Can you imagine if he just turned around and said, God, oh my gosh, I messed up. Please help me. We would all still been chilling in the garden. <laughs> And so many times this happens when, when people don't understand God's love, you know? In this life, we're going to mess up, guys. We're going to mess up. We're going to make wrong decisions sometimes. We're not going to always do what we're supposed to do. We're not always going to do what's right. And anybody who tells you that you have to live at that standard, they're a liar. Because you can't. Nobody is perfect. There is no perfect Christian in this house. I'm sorry, it doesn't exist. We all mess up, including me, including us. If it all, it, we all do sometimes. But because we mess up, it doesn't mean that we have to run. And there's too many times in the church where people mess up and they decide it's time to run. Hit the road, Jack. Start the car like we are getting out of here. Let's go. We just messed up. God is about to do something that we don't like. We can't stay in his house anymore. We can't stay among his people anymore. Get up. Let's go. Let's get out because we've just done something wrong. And when people don't understand God's love, they leave. They hide. They run away from church. They run away from their faith. All of a sudden, they don't, they don't go to God anymore. They don't pray. They don't believe him. And there are too many times that's, that's happened in the church. And you know what happens too? Just like Adam and Eve, when, when people mess up, they decide, okay, you know what? I'm going to find my own fix. I'm going to fix my problem myself. And so Adam and Eve, when they messed up and they sinned, they went and they got leaves and they try to like cover themselves with these leaves. And sometimes in the, in the kingdom, you know, when we mess up, we go and we try to cover what we've just done. And so we go and we find things to hide. And we go and we find things to, to add to it. So then all of a sudden, it's not so bad. At least we think it's not. But it's still there. When people don't understand 
the love of God, it's because they have the wrong interpretation of God. It's because we don't understand his heart. We don't know how much he really loves us. See, there's, there's too many people out there that believe God is out to get us. Like he's this big angry guy in the sky. He's like the Punisher. You guys ever see that card, the Punisher, the cartoon or the comic book? He's like the Punisher in the sky. He's angry. He's an angry God. He's ready to strike you down as soon as you mess up. He's, he's a fearful God. You've got to be afraid of him. He's out there to ruin our lives. He wants to destroy our countries. He wants to destroy our homes. You ever hear preachers? Oh, God is judging Canada and America, and God is judging you. And It's a lie. <laughs> this is not who God is. And they, and they believe that, that God causes sickness, and he sends us afflictions, and he sends us pain, and he sends us trouble. Because in all of these terrible things that are happening to us, somehow we are going to get closer to him, and somehow we are going to realize how much he loves us. It's crazy. Can you imagine? The only way to get closer to your husband is if he beats you and he hurts you and he causes you to be sick and he leaves you without the things that you need and you live a life of poverty and heartache, but somehow in that whole mess, you're going to get closer to him? It's wrong. Church, God doesn't send bad stuff to us. God doesn't send sickness. God doesn't send disease. He doesn't send heartache or trouble or anything negative that can harm us. He doesn't do it. It's a lie. And we're looking at him from the wrong lens if we believe that. Because that is not love. That is fear. Because somehow you think he's going to retribute to you all of the bad things that you've done. I remember once, <laughs> I, there was this, this, this mom at my kid's school, they go to a Christian school, and um, the, the school had shared that she was battling cancer, and I didn't see her around much, but one day I did, and I went right to her, and I'm like, I gotta pray for this girl. She was a young mom, she was just like me, our kids were in the same grade, and I went to her, and I'm like, oh, so-and-so, I, I heard that you're sick, I really want to pray for you, and... Um, she said to me, she's like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing okay. You know, I know God has given me this because he wants me to be stronger. And, he, and he's going to teach me a lesson. And I said, what? I'm like, what? I don't know. No, you're wrong. That's not true. That's not what God wants to do. He didn't send cancer to you. He didn't make you sick. He doesn't want you to learn anything through this. He doesn't want you to have it. This is not a lesson for you. This is the enemy in your life. And we talked a little bit, and I tried to convince her. I'm like, no, God is a good God. He loves you. He wants you to be healed. He does not want you to walk through this. This is not a test, my friend. It's not a test. He's not trying to make you stronger. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to walk in health and fullness. And she let me pray with her, but she walked away still believing that God had given her cancer to make her stronger. This is the worst kind of lie, guys, that God would do something or cause something or allow something in your life that is so detrimental, it crushes you. And it steals your hope and it takes the wind out of your sails and it makes you feel so defeated and it makes you feel like there's no future for you. That is not God. It's not God. There's no way he would use these things to bring us closer to him. It doesn't happen. It is so far from the truth. I couldn't convince her. And then I heard a few weeks later that she passed away. And she left these two beautiful little kids. What lesson is there in that? That her kids now grow up without a mom? that her husband is left to raise them on, her, on his own? What lesson is there in this? There's no lesson, friends. This is not God. And people buy into this stuff because they don't understand how much they are actually loved.